I'm Elaine Petricelli. I have the honor of being the president of Book Passage and uh, to work with the amazing Dr. Denise Lucy on the Institute for Leadership Studies lectures. I'm really excited today. Uh, I, I hope that you will be with us for the rest of this 11th season of our lecture series. Come on Wednesday night, the 22nd at 7 to hear Dr. Atul Gawande. I know that some of us had the privilege of hearing him here when he wrote, wrote his amazing book, The Checklist Manifesto, uh, which has saved so many lives in hospitals and has saved book passage from chaos more than once. Every time I don't do a checklist, I think of him and I'm sorry. Uh, that he will be here on Wednesday evening, then on the 1st of November, the great chef Mario Batali will be here and uh, on the 4th of December uh, Carlos Santana will be here with his memoir and he will be in conversation with the man whose voice you fell in love with if you were watching the Roosevelts, our wonderful Peter Coyote. So we didn't know that when we announced the series, so this is an extra. If you uh, decide that you want to get tickets, you can ask the Book Passage staff out front, go on our website or give us a call, we'll get you tickets. In the meantime, I'm going to now turn it over to the people who are going to give us this amazing afternoon. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the Leadership Lecture Series in partnership with Book Passage, Marin in San Francisco's independent bookstore. My name is Fred Dopfell. I am a partner and chair of the co-chair of the investments for Private Ocean Wealth Management, a sponsor. I am also a professor of finance here in the Borowski School of Business. This series is a program of the Institute of Leadership Studies in the Borowski School. And this institute is a center for leadership development, offering education and training for students and professionals to become better leaders. The Institute also hosts public forums like this one to engage the campus and community in discussion highlighting inspired acts of leadership across the disciplines. And this afternoon, the series welcomes Secretary Leon Panetta, founder and chairman of the Panetta Institute for Public Policy, to discuss his new book, Worthy Fights, a Memoir of Leadership and War and Peace. The live performance of this will also be aired on Dominican's website, podcast on Penguin Radio, and aired Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Public TV Channel 30. Introducing our special guest this afternoon, Dominican President Mary Marcy. Last spring, President Marcy announced the largest gift in Dominican's 124-year history. When fully realized, the gift will mean $25 million to in new revenue to the university, the naming of the Andrew P. Borowski School of Business, the founding of the Francoise Olapage Center for Global Innovation, and the supporting of the One Dominican Experience, a set of initiatives uh, that will integrate the best of the liberal arts and the best of the professions with a comprehensive Dominican educational experience. President, <laughs> President Marcy recently was named to a national steering committee of colleges and universities that will assess the future of independent colleges. And she serves on the Higher Education Advisory Board of the National Council on Education and the Economy. Also on the editorial board of the Journal of Liberal Education. And she is also the academic, an academic advisory council member of the Panetta Institute. She is a political scientist. President Marcity earned her PhD and Master of Philosophy from Oxford University. Dr. Marcy, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Mary Marcy.
Thank you and welcome. I am thrilled to be here this afternoon and I'm honored to be doing something that we don't get to do very often, which is to publicly acknowledge and thank people who have made a difference, not just in a person, one of our lives, but in all of our lives. Leon Panetta is a remarkable, remarkable public servant, and he has been for decades. And one of the great attractions for me and great pleasant surprises in coming to Dominican was realizing that we had a relationship with the Panetta Institute and that our students worked with the Panetta Institute every year and that I would have a chance to meet and get to know Leon Panetta and his wife Sylvia. What I didn't know at the time, and I've since learned, is the reason, um, one of the reasons we have a relationship with the Panetta Institute is that Leon's wife, Sylvia, is a proud alumna of Dominican University of California. So I will be relatively brief because if you took the time to outline Secretary Panetta's entire uh, leadership history, uh, we wouldn't have time for any conversation. And I think that you have seen him enough uh, on TV and over the years that you know a lot of the highlights. So I want to hit just a few of them. What you may not remember, you may have known at one point, is that Secretary Panetta has served as a Republican in the Nixon administration and as a Democrat in the Clinton and Obama administrations. He has a habit of being on the right side of history, uh, which means that he was fired by the next administration. <laughs> he created the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary when he was a member of Congress. He balanced the budget in the Clinton administration. He helped eliminate Don't Ask, Don't Tell when he was, was in uh, the Obama administration. And he's been involved in numerous other major decisions nationally and indeed in the world. He began his political career working in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Then he became a congressman from California where he, he was re-elected eight times. He unseated an incumbent, which was particularly hard to do in that era. He was a director of the Office of Management and Budget, White House Chief of Staff for President Bill Clinton, and later director of Central Intelligence Agency, and finally Secretary of Defense. I mentioned that he helped found the Panetta Institute with his wife Sylvia. The Panetta Institute, among other things, helps train the next generation of public servants. And I am very happy to say that a number of Dominican alumni have participated as interns and in that leadership program at the Panetta Institute. And many of these alumni are with us today and have remained in public service. So I'd like them to please stand so we could recognize them. Welcome back. And if you, if you really want to hear stories about Secretary Panetta, I suspect these are the people to talk to. <laughs> I will say, in being on the right side of history, sometimes it's the grand things, and sometimes it's just good instincts and good timing. For example, one of the many things in the midst of book tours and television appearances that Secretary Panetta did this year was he threw out the first pitch at a Giants-Dodgers baseball game. <laughs> He will also soon receive one of the nation's highest honors, the William J. Donovan Award, named after General Donovan, the only American to have received our nation's four highest awards, including the Medal of Honor. The Donovan Award is given for distinguished service in the interest of the democratic process and the case for freedom, and it is hard to imagine an American more deserving this, of this award than Leon Panetta. Please join me in welcoming back to Dominican Secretary Leon Panetta. Welcome back. Nice to be back. Uh, this is uh, this is a lot of. A lot of history here for, uh, you know, both myself and my wife. Uh, and uh, we, we, first, we first met uh, at a, uh, it was an open house at Santa Clara. In those days, this was an all women's school and Santa Clara was an all men's school. And we used to invite all of the Catholic women's schools to come down for an open house. And 
very thoughtful. That's the way it very, was very in those days. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we were we pinned corsages on the girls as they got off the buses, and uh, that's how I. Uh, Met Sylvia uh, at, uh, she was one of those coming to the open house and uh, something clicked. And uh, from then on, I came here for some dances that were held here at Fanjo and uh, had a chance to, uh, to spend some time here. It's a good thing I, I was telling Mary that uh, one night I slept in a car outside of her dorm. And it's a lucky thing that the nuns didn't throw me in jail at that point. So. <laughs> They didn't need to. They already knew his name. They knew where he lived. They, <laughs> <laughs> they knew the entire hierarchy at Santa Clara. It was you under got control. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know that we have uh, an audience that is very interested in current events and well informed. And I also know that you have been on a formidable book tour. And this isn't headline news. So I, I think that uh, rather than diving right into the same questions that, that many folks have asked you, I wanted to explore a little bit some of the other areas that you talk about in your Great. book. And I, I know there'll be time for Q&A later and we will certainly get to current events. But what people may not know uh, from some of the interviews and some of the sound bites that the media has picked up is how profound a memoir this is and how fully it encaptures the life of, of a remarkable public servant. And I thought we could talk a little bit about some of the other pieces along the way. Uh, and we can end with Ebola and ISIS and Iraq and Syria and whatever else we need to talk about. <laughs> but I, one of the things that, that struck me immediately in reading your book, and I, I, I wasn't aware of it, is, is something that we think a lot about at Dominican. And in fact, we talk a lot about in higher education. We talk about first generation college students and first generation Americans and the importance of uh, opportunity and, and the opportunity that higher education would, can offer. What I didn't know is that you were a first generation college student. And in fact, a first, you were the first generation in your family to be born in the United States. Right. Could, could you talk a little bit about your family history and, and what le before sure. you got to Santa Clara, what led you to Santa Clara and ultimately to Sylvia? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I really, I really had the privilege in many ways of living the American dream. Um, I was the son of Italian immigrants, uh, and they came here like millions of others in the early 30s. Uh, little money in their pocket, few language abilities, few skills, uh, and uh, traveled all of that distance to a, uh, to a strange land. Uh, I used to ask my father, why would you do that? Because even though they came from a poor area in Italy, Calabria, uh, they at least had the comfort of family. So why would you leave all of that to travel all of that distance to a strange land? This was not a time of Google or the internet. They didn't know where the hell they were going uh, when they got on a ship to come to this country. And so I asked him that, and he I'll never forget his answer, which was that my mother and he believed that they could give their children a better life in this country which is in many ways the American dream. That's what we want for our children and for their children. Uh, and they, you know, they, they worked hard. They struggled, they sacrificed. My father was the 13th in his family. Uh, and he had several brothers who came over before him. Uh, one brother, his oldest brother, Bruno, settled uh, in Sheridan, Wyoming. I think he worked in the mines, worked on the rail railroads uh, like immigrants in those days, and then worked in the mines and then you know, got settled uh, in a grocery business there. And then uh, another brother, Tony, uh, came out to California. So according to Italian tradition, you should visit your older brother first. And so when they came, they went and visited Bruno in Sheridan, Wyoming, and spent one winter in Sheridan, Wyoming. <laughs> and my mother suggested it was time to visit the other brother in California. <laughs> even, without Google, even without Google, they figured that out. That was good. <laughs> so they, they did and managed to make their way to uh, Monterey, thank God. Uh, where I was born. And uh, my father opened a restaurant in downtown Monterey during the war years, uh, which was, I mean, from, Monterey was kind of a jump in town in those days for a couple reasons. One, they were catching a lot of sardines. Cannery Row uh, was, uh, you know, Steinbeck's Cannery Row was in full-fledged operation there. Uh, and uh, so that was, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of work and, and families that were involved in the fishing industry. But in addition to that, there was Fort Ord, which was a military training post 
Uh, and they, all of these young men were coming from across the country uh, and being trained there to go to the battlefields of World War II. And so you can imagine Monterey, downtown Monterey was kind of the last stop uh, in terms of uh, civilization for them. So, you know, um, downtown Monterey was, uh, was jumping. And my, my father did the cooking in the restaurant. My mother handled the cash register. She had a button under the cash register to call the MPs if anybody got fresh with her. Uh, and she did that a few times. Uh, and my father went after a few guys with his knife uh, a few times. Uh, and again, you know, they were hard working. I mean, it, you know, started at six o'clock in the morning and sometimes go till uh, two o'clock, two a.m. in the morning because that's when the bars closed. Uh, and they stayed open that time. And my earliest recollections were washing glasses in the back of that restaurant uh, on a chair. Uh, my parents believed that child labor was a requirement uh, for us. <laughs> and, that, and that was kind of the nature of it, that you know, we, were, you know, we, we were all working hard. And uh, when my, after the war, my dad sold the restaurant and he bought some property in Carmel Valley and uh, planted a walnut orchard. And again, we were working out there. My brother and I were working with him, uh, irrigation pipes, working with a hoe, uh, doing all the work that had to be done. And I tell this story because uh, as the walnut trees got older, my father would go around with a pole and hook in those days and shake each of the branches. Uh, and we would be underneath collecting the walnuts. When I got elected to Congress, my father said, you know, you've been well trained to go to Washington <laughs> because you've been dodging nuts all your life, uh, which was true. Uh, they, uh, they believed deeply in, in this country. Uh, my father and mother both encouraged that we would get involved uh, with public service and give something back to the country that gave them the opportunity that uh, they enjoyed. Uh, and for that reason, I became you know, very interested uh, in uh, you know, uh, student body uh, activities when I was in high school, same thing in college. And then I, got, you know, I took a poli-sci major, uh, went to law school, and, um, and then I had to go in the Army because uh, I went through ROTC and had to serve for two years in the Army. And when I got out of the Army, uh, my father wanted me to go into practice with my brother in Monterey. And I, I said, you know, I really want to do something. I really want to do more. And I didn't know anybody in Washington. I didn't uh, have any ties. You know, my, my parents were not politically active. But I decided to write uh, an aide to Lyndon Johnson, whose name was Joe Califano. And the only reason I wrote him is because his name was Califano and my name was Panetta. So I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, I'm really very proud of the fact that there's an Italian American working in the White House for the president. And, uh, you know, I, I'd really like some help to see if there were some opportunities to come back and work there. Well, sure enough, he called. I was in, in the G2 shop, which is the intelligence shop uh, at Fort Ord, and I got a call from Joe Califano who actually set up some appointments in Washington and had a chance to do that. Ultimately, I used that as an opportunity to uh, go to Capitol Hill, and I walked into the office of uh, then Senator Tom Kuchel, who was a Republican senator from California, and uh, sure enough, uh, he, got, he gave me the job, and uh, you know, 50 years later, uh, I was still in Washington. Yes. And, and it, it was a background that invited you to, to give back and invited you to public service. But it's interesting, too, to find the, the pieces that informed you later um, that were not always as, as positive. And one of the things that your family went through was that your, your Italian grandfather was here when the Second World War began. Yeah, he, and came, he came over in 1938 to visit my mother. And the war broke out, and they would not allow Italian aliens to uh, go back to Italy. Uh, it really, it really helped me because he basically uh, babysat and, and uh, took care of me while my parents were working in the uh, restaurant. And uh, my grandfather was kind of this big, very wonderful guy who uh, had a great, great smile. Uh, was a wonderful person. Uh, he didn't speak much English, and so if I was going to eat, I had to learn Italian. 
uh, because otherwise I wasn't going to get anything to eat. Uh, and so I learned how to, you know, uh, Italian and speak with him. And he used to take me for walks down by the wharf and uh, used to engage in conversations with a lot of the Italians that were there. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I really, you know, as I said, he was really the person who uh, helped, uh, you know, to, to raise both my brother and I. And then uh, they decided to order uh, alien Italians inland because they were considered security risks. And so we had to find a place for him in San Jose to live. And we finally found a, a rooming house there. And uh, I remember driving him to uh, San Jose with my family. And uh, I was, my eyes were full of tears because I, I didn't understand why my grandfather, you know, was being forced to, uh, to go inland. And, you know... I, Normanetta is a is a dear friend. We we served together in the Congress, and uh, it's nothing like obviously the internment that the Japanese Americans went through. But I think we both used to talk about uh, having similar feelings about you know knowing what was happening, but at the same time being very devoted to this country, and it it kind of you know makes you think a lot about uh, what our responsibilities are. By by the way, just a fun thing, Norm. Norm's, Norm's last name was Manetta. My name was Panetta. Uh, we were both in the Congress together, and Tip O'Neill could never get us straight. He used to always, <laughs> used to always call me Norm. He called Norm Leon. What was, what was even worse was the Carter administration couldn't get us straight. <laughs> so when the Italian prime minister would come to town, they would invite Norm Manetta to the White House. <laughs> And when the Japanese prime minister came, they would invite me to go to the White House. And, uh, you know, Norm and I took it uh, all in good fun. We finally put a, a softball team together and said we played under the sign of the rising pizza. That was our <laughs> symbol for our softball team. <laughs> the Minetta Panettas. <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to fast forward a little bit further into some of the, the work that you became very well known for, but I'm going to draw on your past and, and give you a little bit of a hard time or perhaps our students some hope. And, and, and I don't know that you draw this parallel. It's, 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 you know, it's the pedantic academic in me. You talk about your, uh, your early schooling and, and uh, some of the activities you're involved in. You also said you really love civics and you were interested in history and you weren't so good at algebra. And then a few decades later, you become, <laughs> a few decades later, how do you make your name in Congress by running the budget committee? And a few, in a decade after that, you're in charge of the Office of Management and Budget. Should we take this as a sign of hope or as a sign of uh, trepidation? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, no, I think I think it is a sign of hope because uh, I've I've always been a pragmatist, and uh, you know. Algebra formulas and algebra used to always drive me nuts. But, you know, when I sat down with a budget where there were numbers assigned to programs, that I understood uh, and that I could work with. And, um, you know, it, it was because the thing that attracted me to the budget committee was the fact that, you know, budgets are really not just about numbers. They're about priorities. I mean, we reflect our priorities in our budgets, and that's true at the federal government level as well. And so the ability to work with the entire federal budget and to look at the priorities of the President and of the Congress and to determine, you know, how, much, how many resources are we going to devote to various programs was really an introduction for me into what government is all about and the responsibilities that we have. And it, it really made me understand not just one program. I mean, members of Congress sometimes get boxed in in one committee or another and then get tied. You know, because I was on the Ag Committee, I could have spent, you know, all of my life working on agricultural issues. But the budget opened up the full spectrum of all of the activities that we were involved in. And, you know, and I also learned there are good programs and there's lousy programs. There are effective programs and there are programs that are a waste. And the ability to kind of work through that, understand it, be able to make judgments on priorities became something that I truly enjoyed, uh, both in the Congress and then as OMB director with Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that, that really comes through in your book and uh, 
because I'm a political scientist, I say this with great, you know, with great, this is a great accolade, but you're truly a policy wonk in yeah. the sense that you, uh, you want, didn't want to just have grand ideas. You wanted to know how they were going to affect people and what the difference was going to be five or ten years down the line. The other thing that comes through, which I, I want to ask you about in terms of the current climate, is that you seem to take great joy in that part of politics that not everyone enjoys, which is working behind the scenes, trying to find the compromise, uh, kind of understanding what's going to, to make a bill get, get passed or get through, uh, even if it involves compromise on your own end. There's so much conversation right now about the climate in Washington. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what yeah. you see that's different and what isn't from that era. Yeah, no, it, it's, a, you know, it's a real concern uh, that I think uh, when people ask me about the biggest threat to our national security, the biggest threat to our national security is the dysfunction in Washington and the inability of both parties, uh, the President and Congress, to be able to work together to deal with the issues confronting this country. I've seen Washington at its best, and I've seen Washington at its worst. I mean, I have, I have seen Washington work. I mean, when I first went back as a legislative assistant to Senator Kekul, uh, who was a progressive Republican out of the Hiram Johnson tradition in California, Earl Warren, Goody Knight, others like that. Uh, and uh, so I, when I went back, Kiko was very much involved uh, on issues uh, and involvement with, uh, with a lot of Democrats. But he had, there were other Republicans there as well. Some in the audience might remember some of these names. People like Jacob Javits from New York, uh, Clifford Case from New Jersey, Hugh Scott from Pennsylvania, George Aiken from Vermont. Uh, Cooper from Kentucky, Hatfield from Oregon. Uh, and they were working with people like, you know, Henry Jackson from Washington and Magnuson uh, and uh, Mansfield and Fulbright uh, and Dick Russell and Sam Irvin, uh, you know, who were people who really were statesmen. Of course they had their political differences. Yes, they fought each other in political campaigns. But when it came to the big issues, they really felt it, it was their responsibility to work together on these big issues. Uh, Kekul worked with Henry Jackson on developing the Redwood Parks, and I saw him you know, negotiate uh, that proposal. Uh, Kekul worked with Javits and others on civil rights legislation. Lyndon Johnson obviously was moving civil rights legislation. We were working together. Everett Dirksen was involved in working on civil rights legislation. So they produced some landmark legislation by virtue of working together. And it was important for the country. When I got elected to Congress, Tip O'Neill was the speaker and Bob Michael was the minority leader. They had their differences, but on big issues facing the country, whether it came from a Republican president like Ronald Reagan or a Democratic president, a Carter, they worked together to try to make sure they could uh, you know, uh, produce what was, what was needed for the country. I mean, I, I was trained in that atmosphere which was to work on a bipartisan basis with others to try to develop legislation. And that, that was really encouraging for me. I, I was not somebody who just wanted to sit down uh, and uh, you know, just shuffle papers and not get things done. I wanted to represent my district. I wanted to deliver things back to my district. And so I learned from all of my history Okay, how do, how do we get these things done? I mean, I, you know, a, a good example, you talked about the, the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. Well, when the Reagan administration came in, it was a guy named uh, Secretary Watt who was in Interior. Well, Watt wanted to put up uh, the entire coastline for sale, uh, for offshore drilling. And, you know, I, I said, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I, I represent Monterey area, Big Sur, uh, you know, area that is extremely attractive uh, coastline. Uh, and I said, he can't be serious about wanting to you know, put that up for sale. So I got another congressman, uh, Don Clawson, who was a Republican from Mendocino in that area. And I said, we've got to go see him. So, so we did. And I said, you know, Secretary Watt, I said, I, I know the need for energy and the need to be able to develop some of this. But I said, there are areas that are pristine that are national treasures like Yellowstone and Yosemite, uh, and that's what Big Sur is all about, that need to be protected. And he said, well, you know, he said, everything ought to be sold, and if there's some areas that can be protected, we'll fight that out later. I said, no, that's not good enough. So what we did 
is we, I put together legislation on an appropriations bill that basically stopped funding. So it was a little gimmick you can use to get your policy across. I used the appropriations bill to say no funds shall be used for the purpose of developing offshore drilling. And that stops it. Uh, I, I was able to build a coalition, Republicans, Democrats. I got other states interested in it, Oregon, Washington, some of the states on the East Coast. And we were able to pass that legislation. It was called a moratorium. We passed it every year. I think, you know, for a number of years it was passed. But I worried that in an energy crisis, uh, that was going to, it was going to lose. And so for that reason, developed the idea of establishing a permanent Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And so I developed the legislation on that. Uh, NOAA had looked at it, but then dropped the idea. And I said, well, damn it, I'm going to pass it legislatively. And what I did was I took that legislation and I tied it to another bill that I knew was going to go to the White House and be signed. Mm -hmm. I buried it in the bill. <laughs> and uh, it passed. And when the president signed the bill, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary was created. Now, I just I go through that because the nature of governing is that it is a give and take process. It is a process of working towards consensus. It's a process of having to fight your way in order to get things done. That's the nature of legislating. And governing, look, I mean, governing is not easy. I know that. God, I, I, you know, 50 years I've, I've learned that lesson. It's not easy. You have to deal with people you don't like. Some are smart, some are dumb, some are honest, some are dishonest, some are crooks, some are people that really want to get things done. It's a cross-section of America. But you have to engage. You've got to deal with those people. That's, that's the nature of legislating. I mean, I, I wish that logic could prevail in Washington. It doesn't work that way. You know, you, you can present, you know, logical, uh, you know, positions, but ultimately you then have to roll up your sleeves and make sure that you get the votes you need in order to get things done. I mean, that, that movie Lincoln, I just, you know, it, it, was, it was very good to make the point. Abraham Lincoln wants passed the 13th Amendment. He's willing to go after every damn vote you need, even if you have to buy the votes, in order to get the 13th Amendment passed. I have seen that same process time and time again. When we were passing the Clinton budget, I think I had to sell about six bridges to get the votes I needed in order to pass that budget. But you do that because it, it's worth it. That's what, that's what legislating is all about. And that's what's missing today, is that inspiration to work together, to give and take, to get something done. That's what's needed today in order to do the right thing in Washington. And the. The phrase used to be that politics at least stops at the water's edge, that whatever our fights are about domestic policy, that in terms of international relations and particularly threats to safety, that Democrats and Republicans will come together. Yeah. And, and I think clearly that has changed as well. I, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper with you and think about why, because it seems that you know, the nature of the threat has changed you know, in the, the period in which you have been director of the CIA and then Secretary of Defense. We've gone from you know, everywhere from North Korea to Libya to the Ukraine and Russia more recently, and now we're, we're back in Iraq again, worried about Iraq and Syria. It moves very quickly. It's very asymmetrical. It's very different than, I think, the more con conventional coalitions against a easily identified threat right. that happened in World War II and the post-World War II era. So, is it about the fact that the threat is different? Is it about the fact that the media is different? Is it that the Congress profile is different? What, yeah. what has changed and what do we need to do about it? The answer it? is yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, look, I often get that question, you know, what, what's changed? Because, you know, as I've described Washington that worked and, and the Washington that you see today, what, you know, what are the reasons for this tremendous partisanship and gridlock and confrontation that we see today? And there's a number of factors that feed into it. There isn't just one silver bullet. I wish there were. Uh, there are a number of factors. One is the margin of power, you know, is very thin, both the House and the Senate. So both parties are very partisan in making sure they go after that power. And it, you know, they require uh, as a result of that, a lot more confrontation with the other party in order to show the differences. Uh, so that's one thing. Two, 
the redistricting process. Uh, and by the way, you know, California made a reform on redistricting and it was, it was a, a good reform because it provided for a commission to do the redistricting. Uh, and uh, rather than having the parties cut a deal, creating safe Republican, safe Democratic seats, most of the redistricting in the country uh, is a deal in which you create these safe seats. And so if you create a safe seat, then you don't worry about the center. You worry about people running against you from the extremes. So if you're a Republican, you worry about a Tea Party guy running to your right. And if you're a Democrat, you worry about somebody running to your left. So it tends to move members more to the extremes than to the center. Uh, and that's a reality. Uh, thirdly, there's a hell of a lot of money in politics now. Uh, too damn much money. Uh, and it's coming from PACs. Uh, of every kind. The Supreme Court basically lifted the limits on most of this stuff. It's a wide open race for money. And if you're, if you're out there getting that kind of money, it's coming from special interests that don't particularly want you to make any waves or make any changes. And so that has a tremendous influence in the gridlock. Uh, then the media, frankly. The media is interested in sound bites. They aren't interested in people working together. You know, you've got you know, more and more media. They're, they're more oriented to either the left or the right. And so they're all working off sound bites, and so the parties work off sound bites rather than really trying to work together. All of that feeds in to a, to a situation where members simply don't want to take the risks necessary to lead. I've often said in a democracy, it only works, you only govern through leadership or crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks, you can get it done. But if it's not there, you're governed by crisis, and crisis drives the process. So here we are uh, at a time when we're facing, obviously, a number of, of serious issues here at home. Uh, and so because of the partisanship and gridlock, there's almost a sense of giving up on, on dealing with those issues that are important, immigration reform, uh, issues like uh, infrastructure funding and all the other things that we need to confront. And, and the same thing becomes true in dealing with foreign policy. We're dealing with so many threats that now it becomes almost immediately political when the president has to deal with a crisis abroad. And I have, you know, I have never seen as many different th threats as we confront in the world today. And it isn't just terrorism and ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which is a serious threat out there to our country. It's also dealing with Iran. It's also dealing with North Korea, a country that is uh, nuclear armed and, and has the capacity of, to use an ICBM to deliver that kind of weapon. Uh, and they've got a nutty dealer, a leader. Uh, this kid, I don't know where the hell he's at. Uh, the only one, you know, uh, I mean, he's, he, he, he does it. He, we don't know what he's thinking. We don't know wh what, he's, what he's working on. Uh, he's totally unpredictable. Uh, you've got the problem with Russia and Putin uh, and probably a new chapter in the Cold War. You've got to deal with China uh, making territorial claims uh, and uh, doing some of the things that challenge international rules. And you've got cyber threats out there. We, we live in a world in which cyber attacks are probably the battlefield of the future uh, and uh, have the potential to virtually cripple this country. So you have all of these threats that have to be dealt with in a political situation that is in gridlock and stalemate and in partisanship. If we have another two and a half years of stalemate, which is likely, no matter what happens in this next election, then I really worry that our inability to deal with the issues facing this country, our economic issues, our social issues, and at the same time not have unity in terms of dealing with these threats abroad, that we could do incredible damage to this country. And that's why I, you know, I keep stressing that the leadership both president and leadership in the Congress really do have to work together to deal with these issues. The country is at stake. And one of the things that's really striking, I think, in your book is when you talk about some of the relatively current issues and crises that you've dealt with, how often the experience not only of working uh, 
across party lines, but actually the, the ways in which you, you led and worked with people within the CIA and within the Defense Department. And one that I thought was particularly telling, which is more about challenge and inspiration and focusing on the good of the whole uh, than it was the, the uh, cross-party bit, was when you first came in, the CIA, and the president said to you, the number one job is taking care of Osama bin Laden. And you found that they actually hadn't been focused. They'd kind of lost their focus on that That's particular right. issue. And along with a lot of clarity about focus and cajoling, you had this great moment that you talk about in the book, and I'd like you to talk about a little bit here, where you said, I want 10 ideas by Monday morning that are new and different, and uh, yeah. we have to do this. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Because that, that, is a, that, that is a different side of political controlling, which <laughs> ended up being profoundly effective. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, I mean, look, just in, in general terms, I mean, um, I, I'm often asked, you know, how do you, how do you manage, uh, you know, the, the various agencies and departments that uh, I've, I've, hit, I've led in one way or another? And, you know, a big part of it is that you have got to constantly challenge people. You got to challenge them to do the job. I mean, what we're seeing today, I mean, whether it's the VA or what you see happening, you know, in terms of even dealing with the Ebola crisis or, you know, the IRS or the Secret Service, is people start, you know, they, they, they do things by the numbers. They move stuff from the inbox to the outbox. They don't really roll up their sleeves. They don't realize, you know, the impact that you can have on people's lives. I mean, the VA thing is particularly disturbing. That, you know, you're not delivering what you should be delivering to people in need. And you have to, my, my experience was you just have to challenge people. You've got to make them know that they have a responsibility, a bigger responsibility to do their job. And you've got to hold them accountable. And so, you know, when I went to the CIA uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, president made clear that uh, going after uh, bin Laden was a big priority, uh, as I believed. And so uh, when I met with our team there, you know, they described how frustrated they were that they, every lead had led to a dead end. They hadn't really have any good information on where he was since Tora Bora, which was, you know, uh, at uh, 2001. Uh, and I said, well, what are you doing to try to develop leads? And they said, well, we, we've just been waiting for, you know, some kind of intelligence information. I said, you know, that's not good enough. You've got to go out and create the opportunities. And so I created a team, a task force, and I said, I want you to brief me every week. And when you come here, I want to hear, you know, your ideas for what we're doing to make sure we go after them. And sometimes they'd come in and they'd say, well, you know, we just can't, we haven't developed anything. I said, that's not good enough. I want you to come up with 10 ideas that, you know, I don't care how crazy they are, just give me 10 ideas about how we can uh, try to have a better lead on uh, bin Laden. And so, you know, they really did begin to work at it. And uh, we developed, there, there were kind of three different approaches that we uh, initially talked about. One was that we were going to try to track one of uh, Osama bin Laden's sons who was in captivity in Iran, house arrest in Iran. And they eventually released him. And so we thought, if we follow him, he might lead us to bin Laden. Uh, and uh, we did, and he unfortunately he got involved with the wrong crowd in Pakistan, and uh, it was a crowd that we were targeting with other operations, and so he got wiped out along with everybody else in that shot, uh, and so that took care of that lead. And then uh, we decided we would, uh, you know, use some technology to try to see if we could uh, find him because he was using computers and that kind of thing. And uh, that didn't quite work. Finally, we focused on the couriers. Uh, bin Laden used couriers to deliver, you know, the messages that he wanted to deliver, the speeches and the various things he did. We didn't, we, we didn't know who these couriers were. And eventually, by going back and piecing together bits and pieces of intelligence. We were able to identify the couriers, and then even more importantly, we're, we attached a face to uh, the name. And we were able to locate them in a town called Peshawar 
in uh, Pakistan. Uh, you know, we, we located them. We saw, you know, we saw the vehicle that they had, and we tracked the vehicle that led us to Abbottabad in this compound. And when we got to the compound, we knew something, something different uh, about this compound just made us excited. Why? Here was a compound. It was three times the size of other compounds, had 18-foot walls on one side, 12-foot walls on another side. They had an 8-foot wall on the third floor, for God's sakes. Third floor, you usually want to see the view. Uh, they had an 8-foot wall there, bob wire. So they had a tremendous amount of security. So something was going on. And we were, we were immediately interested in trying to identify who was there. This is Bin Laden's couriers. They've got a compound with all the security. What's going on? And so that's what uh, led us to doing a tremendous amount of surveillance to try to locate, uh, you know, what was going on there. And we used all kinds of, you know, ways to try to get information. Now, just one, one thing I'll tell you is we had, uh, we saw, we were doing surveillance, we saw a gentleman who would go out into a yard and walk in circles like a prisoner in a prison yard. And I said, you know, we, I knew this, the gentleman was a little older. And I said, for God's sakes, this is a chance to identify this person, see whether it's Bin Laden. So, you know, put a telescope on the mountain, put uh, cameras on the walls, do something to give me a, a you know, an ID on a facial identity of this individual. And they said, no, no, we, we just can't, I mean, the walls are in the way, it's too risky, we don't know quite how to do this. I said, I've seen movies where the CIA can do this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, you know, and, and they, uh, they could. the CIA is from California. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, never, we never got an ID. I finally said, look, can you tell me how tall he is, for goodness sakes? Because, you know, Bin Laden was six foot five. Uh, tell me how tall he is by the shadows. And they, they said, well, we, we might be able to do that. And they came back and told me that, that uh, the, the gentleman's height was somewhere between five foot seven and six foot five. And I <laughs> said, that didn't do much good either. Uh, but, you know, eventually, you know, we pieced together, I, I felt, enough intelligence that warranted the operation. And the president then told us to do the operations. And it was risky because we never had you know, 100% ID. But I do have to tell you that the dedication of the intelligence people, the capability of our special forces to conduct the operation, that was a remarkable combination that resulted in a mission that was very difficult, uh, you know, very complex, 150 miles at night into Pakistan uh, and not knowing exactly what you were going to run into. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I give tremendous credit to the president for making a gutsy decision to do it because, frankly, when we went to the National Security Council, most of the members in the, in the NSC uh, thought, that it, thought that it was too risky mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have some, some, some great lines in the book. And Reflections, and I encourage people to look at it just to, to hear about things that capture uh, something that we know, but we couldn't say it so succinctly. Like there was no such thing as a short meeting with President Clinton. I think that's probably that seems right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm wondering. Uh, one of the things that struck me in the book was how many times uh, Sylvia ended up being on the hotline. You know, you, you would be out. Um, grilling or you'd be out uh, finally enjoying being back home and the phone would ring and uh, poor Sylvia has to call you in and say the White House or someone else is on the line and it was usually someone calling you for the next next uh, yeah. public service job. So I have, have two related questions for you. Uh, the first, because you've gotten that call so many times, is in a couple of years, two and a half years, we have a new president. What are the top foreign policy issues, because things do move so quickly, what are the top foreign policy issues do you think they'll still be facing? And the, the second and not unrelated question is, if you get that call again, will you say yes again? <laughs> <laughs> or will Sylvia just hang up the phone? I, don't, yeah, yeah. I think Sylvia will hang up the phone. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, look, I, I've, I've enjoyed public service. I've always responded uh, to presidents when they've asked me to serve uh, because, because my, of what my parents used to say about, uh, you know, giving something back to the country. And, I, and I've enjoyed all of my positions. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think right now I'd like to work with a different set of nuts back in Carmel Valley. Uh, the, uh, it's going to be a challenge for whoever becomes president with regards to foreign policy issues because I don't, you know, I don't know if many of these will be resolved by the time uh, the next president takes office. Um, we do have uh, this, this war on terrorism uh, and I, I consider it part of kind of one continuum going back to 9-11. 9-11 was a you know, major attack on this country by Al-Qaeda that killed 3,000 people uh, and we declared war on terrorism as a result of that to make sure that not only would we go after those who attacked our country, but that we would make sure that it never happened again, 9-11 would never happen again. Uh, and uh, you know, very frankly, we developed pretty effective operations, uh, both intelligence operations and military operations, to be able to, uh, to go after that threat. But terrorism has metastasized to ISIS, which is an even more fanatical version of Al-Qaeda uh, with uh, similar threats. And uh, you know, we've seen what they've done uh, in Iraq and Syria and the threat that they represent. But we also have Boko Haram in Nigeria. We also have Al-Shabaab in Somalia. We have other uh, uh, elements of uh, Al-Qaeda throughout North Africa that are involved. So this war against terrorism is going to be a very long-term effort to try to, uh, to deal with those threats. And we can do this. I, I, I have great confidence. We've developed the counterterrorism capability to be able to confront them and do it well. But we are also going to have to develop an element of fighting terrorism that we have not done very well, which is to, to also work on the cultural and religious and economic aspects that have young people in the Muslim world turning to this kind of extremism to, uh, to become terrorists. We have got to develop a way to try to reach those individuals. We'll have to work with the countries that are there, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, others. We're going to have to work with them to try to reach out to young people so that we give them a sense that you know, they, they, there is a greater opportunity to be able to to live and to enjoy family rather than uh, live as a terrorist. Uh, and so that's, a, that's something that's going to take a long time. And a new president is going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to deal with Russia and Putin. Uh, and uh, Putin obviously is engaged in a new uh, kind of uh, threatening attitude. Uh, to try to go back at those, uh, those countries that were part of the old Soviet Union, reassert their influence over those countries. Uh, we're going to have to make clear that that cannot happen. Uh, so we're going to have to draw some lines on Putin. And at the same time, find ways, hopefully, to reach out and see whether he's willing to uh, work with us uh, in those efforts. We've got to deal with the Iran. Iran has 19,000 centrifuges. Uh, they want to enrich fuel. Uh, they have the ability to develop, uh, you know, are working on the ability to develop perhaps a nuclear weapon. Uh, and if that, you know, if that happens, that could be a real threat to uh, peace in the Middle East. So we're in negotiations now. Whether we're successful or not uh, remains to be determined. Uh, we have to deal with North Korea uh, and make sure that we are prepared for any kind of, of uh, you know, possible aggression from uh, North Korea. We have to deal with China you know, and have a constant dialogue with China. We are going to have to deal with, as I said, uh, the cyber threat that's out there. So a new president is, is going to have to be able to provide the leadership in the world to deal with every one of those threats. I mean, one thing we're finding is from recent events, and I, I understand why the president was interested in kind of, you know, we've been at war for ten, over 10 years, wanting to turn inward towards this country to deal with the problems here. But as recent events have shown, if the United States is not providing world leadership, nobody else will. As the president himself said, when crisis happens, nobody calls China, nobody calls Russia, you call the United States. 
And so we are going to have to remain strong leaders uh, in the world of the 21st century. Why? Because we are the one country that has the value system that I think can try to assure uh, an effort towards greater peace and prosperity in the world. That's going to be the challenge for the next president. And I You embody that value system, and, uh, and, and it's evolved from sleeping in the parking lot in a car behind, uh, behind Meadowlands right. to, saying a, <laughs> to saying a hell of a lot of Hail Marys uh, in addition to that. That part, of the Hail Marys part hasn't changed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could obviously talk to you all afternoon, but uh, I want to make sure that our audience has a chance to hear some of their questions asked, and I'm, sure. I'm sure that they will hit some of the contemporary events that I, I didn't address directly. So.